again for the invitation to um, uh, present on fracture dislocations or medial tibial plateau fractures of the uh, of the knee. Um, my name is Arvind von Cordella. I'm an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery and I'm spe subspecialized in orthopedic trauma. So oftentimes this is a, a uh, rather important uh, talk on, on what to not to miss in uh, fracture dislocations or Schatzker fours that sometimes potentially act as Schatzker sixes. And oftentimes the question comes up, when do you need to go uh, to the lateral side in these medial sided fractures? So I'll try to uh, provide some rationale there. The medial side of the proximal tibia is sometimes a little bit unfamiliar just because uh, we don't go there very often. The incidence of uh, Shatsko 6 fractures or Shatsko 4 fractures is not very high. Um, the thing to just remember is as long as you keep your incisions and your deep dissection in the sagittal plane in line with the structures, you are fairly safe. Try to avoid to really uh, injure any sort of ligaments, particularly the deep uh, uh, medial collateral ligament. If you cut that, you may cause a significant instability. Um, I personally try to um, look at the fracture side and decide whether it is uh, either anterior or posterior to sort of the MCL my fractures and then decide what approaches I use, whether it's anterior medial or posterior medial or even posterior approaches. Remember that the, the PES uh, with the gracilis semitonal tendinosis and the sartorius attached there, you could um, release them, tag them and suture them at the end of the case if uh, you need to release them at, in the first place. So clearly you have multiple options for addressing proximal tibial fractures, uh, particularly on the media side. You can do direct anterior, which uh, has fallen out of favor a little bit, uh, straight medial or and posterior medial approaches. And then you can do the same posterior medial approach in a prone position or just a, a extensive posterior approach, which I'll discuss in a little bit. It is important to remember that um, you provide stability not with a very flexible device on the media size, such as the one third tubular plate. It is uh, not sufficient to withstand the amount of forces that go across the medial tibial plateau. So at the least use a 3.5 recon plate, uh, but not as a primary. It is uh, then rather use, uh, uh, you know, contralateral tibial plateau plates or, or obviously pre plates if you have um, access to them. In my mind, there are four types of Schatzker four fractures, um, sort of fracture dislocations of the knee. There's the isolated medial tibial plateau, then there's a high energy tibial plateau with central and lateral articular depression. And then there's um, a part of this Schatzker six fractures. They may have a medial sided component sometimes even with a coronal split um, or just as the isolated posterior medial shear. And that really depends on how the force imparts through the knee to cause certain fracture patterns. This is the high energy medial tibial plateau fracture where you have a dislocation of the entire knee where you have the femur go with a fractured portion on the medial side. So you can see that the lateral uh, proximal tibia does not line up with the lateral distal femur clearly. You know, oftentimes, as the lateral femoral condyle impacts onto the tibial plateau, you either have lateral or central depression. And then clearly, this is the, the fracture pattern where you really have to be careful not to miss any uh, soft tissue uh, uh, injuries, such as uh, vascular injuries, nerve um, traction injuries, or transactions. Transactions is obviously a little uncommon, but traction injuries. This is just showing a, a, a sort of study where they looked at Schatzka four uh, tibial plateau fractures, and they had incredibly high incidence also of, of lateral meniscal tears and ACL disruptions in addition to the neurovascular structures. So let me just try to um, show one case that elucidates or um, uh, presents the, the, the common um, fracture pattern. Here you can see it's just flipped essentially, right? Like you have the 
fracture dislocation, the lateral side of the tibial plateau does not uh, match up with the lateral femoral condyle. You have lateral depression and you have a fairly big sized medial tibial plateau fracture. And on the lateral x-ray, you can see that there's probably some sort of shear component to this injury. If you can, it would be good to get a CT scan to further elucidate and validate your, your sort of idea of what has happened. And here, the two things to really look for on the, on the sagittal view, you can see the posterior medial shear component, as well as the incredibly deep compression of the articular surface from the lateral side. So it's probably pushed in to, to two to three centimeters in the, to the proximal tibia. And you can imagine if you have that amount of force, you could potentially have some neurovascular structures. These are just some intraoperative um, clinical findings um, of, of strategies of how to treat this. Here, I attempted to elevate the lateral side with the cob through the fracture side or from the medial side, but was unable to do so, as you can see here. So I aborted that, went to the medial side, fixed the medial side to provide a, a good column to build my lateral side against left the screws in the proximal segment short. Then now you can see I made a lateral incision, a, a standard lateral approach to the proximal tibia, elevated the lateral, lateral tibial condyle, placed some K wires, placed a plate, compressed it, made sure that my plates are adequately positioned, and then filled up the remainder of the uh, screws with locking and non-locking screws. And then, as you can imagine, there was a fairly deep void. So we, we uh, uh, filled that up with bone substitute material. She did well. And there's another case which uh, elucidates the other type of fracture uh, dislocations where you do not have a central or lateral depression. This is sort of an isolated uh, post-remedial shear. Again, you can sort of see that it's the on the axial view on the right side, you can see the entire medial tibial plateau fracture is uh, broken off. But also here on the first images on the center, you can see that it's sort of a shear component. So it's really important to uh, uh, use a, a stout plate uh, on the posterior medial uh, aspect of the proximal tibia to withstand those forces. A nice way to reduce the dislocation is using a periarticular clamp, which you can see here where it's uh, basically on the lateral side of the proximal tibia and on the medial side of the distal femur to push over the, the uh, tibial uh, plateau underneath the, the femur. And that really allows you to uh, uh, fine tune your medial, medial sided uh, uh, fracture and then, and then place a plate. So then the idea is when, when, what's your strategy, how to address those? So clearly if it's a medial sided only fracture, you can decide depending on where the split comes out, whether it's anterior or posterior to the MCL, you can decide whether you're going to go uh, posterior medial or anterior medial. Uh, the time when I go medial and lateral is if there's lateral joint impaction, or central joint impaction, which obviously is not as important, but uh, if it's um, big enough that you feel that you need to tamp it up and you cannot get it from the medial side, you can easily get it from the lateral side. Occasionally, if the lateral side is intact, you may have to actually do an osteotomy of the lateral tibial plateau to access it. As I mentioned also, there's a fairly high incidence of meniscal injuries, particularly lateral sided as it disrupts um, or, or as you have a dislocation, it sort of pulls the lateral meniscus uh, potentially into the knee joint and, and can be actually a source of uh, inability to reduce the, the fracture, particularly the, the lateral depression. Um, so when to go posterior, I'll, I'll go a little bit more into detail uh, in another talk, but essentially the most important thing is, especially when you have an isolated hyperextension injury to the knee, and it's really a posterior shear with posterior medial and posterior lateral involvement, it is just easier um, to, to do this in a prone position. This is just a, a summary. There's four subtypes of uh, Schatzka force, the isolated medial, the high energy type four with lateral impaction, posterior shear and medial side as part of a bicondylar uh, fracture. There is just another nice little uh, uh, case of a young guy 
skiing accident, the x-rays do not look particularly concerning, except for the, the one on the very right and the lateral. But then when you actually look at the CT scan, you can really see that there's a fairly big sized posterior medial shear component with a little bit of, of lateral impaction of the tibial plateau. So what we did here, because the injury was not as severe, we uh, accessed everything through a small little uh, burr hole uh, from the medial side and tamped up the lateral tibial plateau and then placed the single screw as a rafter. And finally, another posterior medial shear fracture just to drive home the message of really trying to put a plate right at the apex of the, of the fracture on the posterior side. So with that, I'll stop here and then move on to the posterior um, shear type fractures. Let me just share my screen again. So then the question really is, at one point do you pull the trigger and actually go to a posterior approach to the proximal tibia? Which of the ones really require a straight posterior approach? I'd like to highlight this with uh, one case here. We can see that there is something not quite right, right? You see the proximal fibula fracture and you see something on the tibial plateau. It doesn't seem right. The media side is broken off. There's a small little cortical disruption, but it's not quite clear what, what's going on here. But the CT really shows a little bit more of, of, the, of the problem. So you have a posterior lateral as well as a posterior medial component of the entire posterior condyle. You have a shear component in both the sagittal and the coronal plane. And then when you look at the CT 3D reconstructions, you can clearly see that both uh, are sort of, uh, uh, both the entire posterior condyle is, is involved and nothing in the front. When you do these uh, approaches from the back, it is uh, of paramount importance that you make sure that before you start, you actually see what you need to see so you don't get blocked continuously by the contralateral leg. And here we can see the pre-op images and then a buttress plate to buttress up the, the, uh, the shear component. The Lobenhofer approach is sort of the, the modification of the posterior medial approach. It's essentially exactly the same. Here are some sort of uh, graphic findings of this. It, it essentially, you can do it either posterior medial or posterior lateral, depending on, on where you have to go. The posterior lateral is a little bit less commonly used just because out of fear of the common perineal nerve, but you can certainly uh, do that. Just remember that you, you are limited by the gastroc and do not have as much excursion to the distal aspect of the proximal tibia rather than if you go from the medial side. These are some clinical pictures of the posterior medial approach in the prone position. We just make an incision on the border of the medial gastroc, essentially identified the gastroc, um, the medial head of the gastroc, look for the pes, the hamstring tendons that run across. Sometimes you can just leave them be. You do not have to release them. And then, and then you carefully dissect under the muscle belly with the cob and place a blunt homen over on the other side of the tibia while making sure that you don't, um, you're careful not to get the, the arterial blood supply to the distal limb. And then this is a little bit, if you struggle, you can extend your incision a little bit. You can even release the um, part of the medial head of the gastric if you cannot get over to the lateral side, but even in muscular people, it's fairly easy to get all the way over. It sometimes helps to uh, not use a tourniquet as well as using asking the anesthesiologist to provide full muscle relaxation. And you can easily see the entire posterior uh, portion of the proximal tibia. And this is him. You can see he's a fairly sizable guy and, and that was his leg. Um, so I, I, I do think it's fairly, it's pretty good to get there or from the media side. If you want to extend it, you can also obviously make an incision in the, in the crease of the knee joint in the back and then um, pull it up on the lateral side of the distal femur, but it's incredibly rare that I feel that you need to do that. <laughs>
So this is sort of the, the highlight slide. I think th this one will tell you a little bit more in detail when you should really consider going poster. So if it's an isolated poster column, then I think it, 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 you just make it easier for yourself if you just lie the patient prone and go from a poster approach, especially when you have a poster medial and poster lateral involvement. In general, if you fix posterior tibial plateau fractures adequately, they have a fairly good clinical outcome, but occasionally they lack a little bit of extension because you cause some scarring in the back of the, the knee. So be mindful, potentially sometimes keep them in extension for a little bit after the operation. It's usually easier for them to regain flexion, but not the extension. And this is just out of uh, MGH where, where we looked at our clinical results. Here you can see an intraoperative um, photograph where you where you essentially go from the medial side all the way up to the lateral side, and here you can see the the medial head of the gastric is is divided and retracted. When you do that, really make sure that um, identifying the neurovascular structures first uh, before you do that. With that, thank you so much, and um, uh, feel free to reach out with any questions by email.